Hello and welcome back. Um, in this video, we're going to take a quick look at the Simsys DSP libraries, in particular the uh, FFT implementation um, and the FFT section, you know, of the library, um, you know, for the Monkey Listen project. But um, this will also be a good overview if you have other applications. So, on ARB's website, if you find the Simsys um, page, they have a kind of a description of the whole Simsys kind of uh, uh, overview, where it's just a standard in interface to the Cortex microcontroller realm. Um, and one part of that uh, is the DSP library, the Simsys DSP library. So the Cortex M4 variant of the, uh, Sim of the M family has instructions to accelerate DSP functions. And uh, in particular, you know, some of those uh, can... Uh, extra instructions can really accelerate FFTs and digital filters. They have fast multiply and accumulate, so on and so forth. So um, so to get a nice fast FFT uh, uh, for a transform, you know, using these libraries is a very good idea. Do not write it from scratch. There isn't, unless you want something very special, th there's no reason to. So um, you can go and just download the library. Now, if you were tuning into the Monkey Listen project, um, you know, I include version 3.2 of the library, you know, already ready to go. So, but you can register here and download the library. Now, Kyle put the HTML documentation, you know, up on the web. So Kyle is an armed company. They are a, they used to be an independent uh, compiler company and they arguably made the best ARM compiler. Well, they are now officially a part of ARM. So they host some documentation for the library. And I'm going to step through this document because um, it's, it's fairly easy to look at. You can actually build the documentation. Um, it's all kind of built into the library through Doxygen, but uh, I'm going to browse through it here. So, you know, in other videos, uh, I have videos on, you know, the, the fixed point number format used by the DSP library. Certainly review those. Look at my playlist to review those. Because in here, I'm going to assume you know all about fixed point and uh, you know all about the data types in the Simpsons DSP library. So I'm going to click here in the software library and click on reference and transform functions. Uh, now, there is a lot of different uh, transform functions. The monkey listen, the one you want, uh, chances are, is the real FFT. All right, and by real FFT, what that means is you feed in real data points, meaning they're real value, uh, and you get a, a complex vector out. So in the case of like the Monkey Listen project, we're recording a microphone. That's real data. It's 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 just a set of scalars we can feed in. Now, I use because the Cortex M4 um, in the variant we use on the uh, the Freedom Board, uh, the K20 D50. Um, does not have a floating point unit. It's all fixed point. Um, so I use the fixed point version. So that's what we're going to look at. Um, now the good news is once you understand the fixed point version, the floating point is actually simpler, um, you know, to use, but it, it, it doesn't, you know, the performance isn't quite as good on an M4 because fixed point will always outperform a uh, floating point um, in almost every case. So, um, so what we're going to look at is the fixed point functions. Now, the core function that does RFFT is ARM real RFFT either Q15 or Q31. So it can operate on these two different data types, the Q15 data type or the Q31. Um, I have a video on the Q31 data type. Uh, if you don't know what that is, watch the video on the Q31 data type. It'll be in the playlist along with other fixed point um, you know, instruction. But once you understand, it'll be just as easy. The Q15 data type is just half the size. So in the case of the monkey listen, uh, we sample the data converter with 12 bits of data, and then uh, we essentially store it in a 16-bit uh, field, which is a Q15 data point, meaning it's 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 a side number, uh, you know, between negative one and one. So what I'm going to do is click on this function to get an idea of what we have to do. So to use this function. 
what you have to do is it has three arguments. It needs a pointer to an instance structure for your FFT. Uh, it needs a pointer to your source data and a pointer to your destination data. And it's simple as that. Now, the instance structure uh, comes from an init function, which we'll look at in a minute. And all you got to do is call the, call the function and you get the data. It's, a, it's as simple as that. Um, now, a couple of notes. Because we're using fixed point, I wanted to point out this sentence right here, that your data, even though it's in Q1.15 format, it's down by two for every stage to avoid saturations, meaning um, adding and multiplying numbers um, uh, and getting a result that needs more than, say, our 16 bits. So you notice in for the 128 point size, if we feed it in Q15 dot format, uh, we actually get a, uh, a 7.9 format on our output, meaning the result, if we want it back to where we want, we got to rescale the data. Now, once again, if you don't understand what I'm speaking about here, watch the fixed point videos and this will make perfect sense. Um, saturation is the worst thing that can happen uh, in a fixed point computation chain, um, or I should say one of the worst things. Um, so uh, once again, both the, the, the forward and reverse transform, same kind of thing. Uh, and once you understand that, uh, you're, you're kind of done. You just can call the function and use it. All right, so what I want to do is uh, uh, point out a few other little things here. Um, let's click on this real FFT function. So this kind of gives you a, a picture of how the real functions actually work. And it turns out the way it does uh, the real data is it actually computes a complex Fourier trans, excuse me, a complex FFT um, on the data. Now, the big thing I want to point out here You know, the important part uh, it, it, that falls out of taking the real transform is kind of the, the way the data is structured in the output, right? And all of the documentation, for whatever reason, uh, for the fixed point has this TBD. We need to document the input and output order of the data. So... Um, after digging around a little bit, um, I found somewhere else that had, you know, the documentation of, of how the data is actually ordered. You know, after digging around, I found on the embed site, because um, embed is an ARM initiative, uh, some documentation for the real FFT um, and the uh, 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 IF, inverse FFT. And so basically, I want to point out here. The order you got to feed it is your real data in, but the order coming out is real zero, imaginary zero, real one, imaginary one. So that, that's important to know because all the other functions kind of depend on that. So you when you feed in real data, it's just a list, but the output, um, you know, it's, it's kind of interdigitated, real and imaginary, real and imaginary. So I wanted to make sure I pointed that out so, uh, you know, you, you, you saw that. Let's go back here, and you can kind of read through. They have a description of how the floating point data is stored and whatnot. Uh, but for the fixed point, let's go to oop, wrong function. We'll come back to that. Uh, all you got to know is you have to feed in a buffer of data um, where you get uh, it's, it's just a list of your data starting at sample zero. And your destination buffer has complex data, real and imaginary, coming out, where the first is a real number, second is imaginary number, uh, third is a real number, fourth is imaginary. Um, so once you understand that, the only other thing we got to figure out here is this ARM RF, uh, this, this instance. So there is an init function where you just init, you, you create two instances, and it turns out you need both an instance for this real and an instance for a complex data structure, for a complex FFT, because internally, the real FFT is just a special case of a complex-valued FFT. So 
Um, all you all you do to uh, set this up is you pass it pointers to some instance structures, and we'll look at that in the code. Um, the monkey listen code, I'll use an example. Uh, it wants the length of the FFT. So we have lengths of 128, 512, and 2048. Notice they're all nice powers of two. Um, it wants to know, are we doing the forward or reverse transforms? It turns out the transforms are very similar. Um, and lastly, there is this bit reverse flag. So this controls whether the, the output is in normal order um, or in rev bit reverse order. So instead of me explaining that, so it turns out the FFT, um, whenever it kind of goes through the structure, it has kind of a neat way of breaking down, uh, say, an R a size FFT, for example, 128. It turns out the first step it does, it breaks it down into, well, that's actually two... Um, transforms of 64 points, then four transforms of 32, so on and so forth. And what you end up with are these little mini FFTs, or I'm sorry, little mini transforms, discrete Fourier transforms, um, but the order's all messed up. So we, there's a bit to control whether what, what the order is, and we set it to one for normal order. Now there is a video to further explain that, there's a video on YouTube called the Fast Fourier Transform Algorithm by Barry, um, I'm sorry, Barry Van Veen, um, that explains this process. Now, if you're just using the library, um, you want normal order. Uh, the only time you do this in the, uh, the reverse order is if you have another, um, I should say, another function that is expecting uh, a, a bit reversal of an output. So in R, we just set it to one. So to get some more history on that, watch that fast forward transform video, and uh, you'll understand, um, then understand what that means. But for using a library, all you really need to know is, do I want my outputs bit reversed or not? In this case, we don't. So we want it in normal order. So really, those two functions, the init and the... Uh, uh, the, the computation of the, the FFT are all we need. So let's take a look really quick at the monkey listen software. So the first thing I got to do is I have to set up the, the FFT instances. And if you remember, the init function required this real instance type, so ARM RFT instance Q15, and the complex Radix4 instance type. So what I do is in main, I just static, these get sta uh, allocated on the stack um, for main. So I have some variable type, variable types. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then in the initialization code, um, let's see if I can spell it initialize correctly. Um, all you got to do is call arm RFT Q15. Um, you pass it a pointer to one instance, a pointer to the other. You give it the length of the FFT and enable um, that we want normal order, not bit reversed order. I, my, the comment's a little confusing here. It says bit reverse flag enabled, which enabled means it's normal order. Um, this last variable here in the list, I set to zero. And that controls whether it's a forward or inverse calculation. So zero means it's the forward transform. I want to take the FFT of my time domain data. All right, so once we initialize it, um, then we can just use the function. So in the monkey listen software, in the I have a video for the monkey listen project just describing giving a high-level overview of how it works. Let's find where we actually compute an FFT. Um, so right here's one. Uh, I simply call the function. I give it a pointer to my instance variable. And then I give it a pointer to the buffer of data that has my 128 points. And then a buffer that stores the, the output. In this case, it's the microphone FFT. And once you call it, um, it will eventually return the FFT in this, um, you know, in, in, in a point in this array.
Now, something important I want to point out that I kind of found out the hard way is that whenever you pass it a buffer of data, uh, don't expect that buffer of data to come out unscathed. It's going to be, it does an in-place FFT where it uses this buffer um, throughout the process. So once data goes in, make sure you don't need that data again later because it's going to get trashed. Um, you know, while working on the FFT. So, because originally I was giving it data uh, from, you know, uh, you know, a, a pre-programmed array that was initialized in Flash. That does not work. Um, so, so it has to be out of RAM. And so I have a, uh, a ping pong buffer scheme in the monkey. Listen, so my buffer I'm working on, uh, you know, is kind of all on its own. Now, the last thing, once you get an FFT, remember, you get a bunch of uh, uh, complex numbers out of the FFT. So the first thing I do is I rescale the data. All right, so I have to scale, rescale the um, components before real to magic before computing the magnitude, because if you remember, the documentation for the FFT says I need to. We have 128 size that generates 256 uh, elements, uh, half real, half imaginary. And remember, it its output format is 7.9 because it has to downscale throughout the process uh, of the FFT so we don't get saturation. So we need to rescale the bit. So here I rescale up by 6. Uh, the next thing I do is I've got to compute the magnitude of the result. So usually we're, we're concerned with the magnitude of the FFT. So and I'll, like, I'll let you look at this all on your lonesome. It's computing the magnitude. So what it does is you give it a vector of real and imaginary values. Now, it's nice. It takes the format that the FFT spits out, um, and it gives you the magnitude uh, of the result. And it's literally doing... Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared, take the square root of that. Um, and we do it on our 128 points. Um, and from there, you take the data and, on the, and take the data and do something with it. In the case of the monkey jam, um, excuse me, the monkey listen, the spectrogram display, because it only has 16 colors, I really chop down the magnitude to get it into like a 4-bit value. Uh, so it's kind of useful for, you know, displaying on a screen. Um but from there, you can do whatever you want. So, um, so I hope that this is a quick overview of the, the the functions and kind of how you use them. They're not that hard once you understand, you know, what you kind of get in and out. So um, tune in for some more videos, and I'll talk to you later.